Uh, we, we've been in a series where well, we just started it last week. My dear friend Craig started the series Whisper last week. Did an awesome job. You guys remember he was over here playing with the little with all the sounds and wah, and ching, ching, ching. And basically just showing all the distractions and all these noises that we have in life. But that God is there uh, oftentimes in a whisper or even the sound of silence waiting for us to perk up our ears and tune in to his frequency. And so that's what this whole series is about. It's about hearing the voice of God and the different ways that we can learn to do that. So I want to go ahead and jump into the word. Uh, we're going to be reading from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 through chapter 4, verse 7. So we're going to cross chapters, but let me just give you a, a, like a little bit of an idea. The whole like chapter and verse thing, that's just... That's just put there so that we can have a reference point. That's not actually the way, those weren't written in there originally. In fact, 2 Timothy is, is, is a letter. It's a letter from the Apostle Paul. And a, and a lot of the New Testament is actually made up of letters from the Apostle Paul, who, who God set in this place in order to be able to encourage and equip and, and, and reprove when needed the different churches in order to spread the gospel and teach people how to live a life that is worthy of the call of Christ. And so 2 Timothy is one of those letters that Paul writes. And this particular one actually uh, has a little bit more of a personal tone than some others because Timothy, for those of you who don't know, was actually a, a spiritual son of Paul and a very dear friend of his. Most historians agree that this particular letter, 2 Timothy, was written from prison while Paul was in his second imprisonment in Rome. And this particular time, it seems that from the way that Paul talks, the way that he writes, Paul knows that the end of his life here on earth is coming soon. And so, and so while this letter is personal, it also comes across as a farewell letter. And I don't know about you, but I tend to, when I hear, I don't know if, you, if, if you've ever heard a story about what someone shares on their deathbed or as they're, ending the, the, or as they're nearing the end of their life, you kind of tune in, right? You're like, wow, they're going to give that message that's like, hey, if you don't hear anything else from my life, please hold on to this. Hold on to this nugget. And granted, we look at all the word as having this weight that we should hold on to it and, and receive it as the truth that it, that it is. But there's something about a farewell message, something about the words that someone shares when they know they're ending their life. And this is where Paul is in prison waiting to be executed for his faith. And he's writing to his dear friend, Timothy. <clears throat> so let's start in verse 14. Chapter 3, verse 14. You can follow along here, but I also in encourage you, if you got your Bible on your phone or on paper or on iPad or whatever new ways there are to read the Bible, that you would pull it out because we're going to be reflecting back, and so it'll be good to have it in front of you. I'm going to be reading from the ESV this morning. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Will you guys pray with me? Father, we thank you for your precious word. Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes 
and that you would bring revelation to us this morning. As we read your word, that we would see this is not just some old book, but it is from your very heart to us. Lord, we pray that your truth would be shared this morning, your truth would be received this morning, and everything else would fall to the ground, and that you would be glorified by, for, by every word that is spoken. <clears throat> we know you're here. We thank you for your presence. And Lord, we pray that you would be in and impacting and guiding every step of this today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, so I, wanna, I actually want to read a little excerpt from the, the book that I was referring to a moment ago. Actually, I don't even know if I told you about the book. I should tell you about the book. <laughs> the book is Whisper. That is what this whole series is based on. It's by a, a pastor uh, and an author in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And um, this is a little story that he tells from the French and Indian War that I, I want to share before we go any further. It says... In this chapter, The Key of Keys, which is actually the same title as this message, on April 14th, 1755, General Edward Braddock sailed up the Potomac River to Georgetown, a sleepy little town on the banks of the river. The British Army anchored long enough to pick up a new recruit, a 23-year-old Virginia planter named George Washington. Washington served as Braddock's aide-de-camp during the ill-fated battle of Monongahela, and it's a miracle he survived. Listen to this. Two horses were shot out from under him, and four musket balls passed through his coat. Washington didn't just hear musket balls whistling past his ears. He heard the still, small voice whispering. Death was leveling my companions on every side of me, wrote Washington in a letter to his brother, but by the all-powerful dispensations of providence, I have been protected. Now let's go back to the place where Braddock anchored his ship. In the city named after Washington, we know as Washington, D.C., just past the place where Constitution Avenue turns into the Theodore Roosevelt Bridge, there is a nondescript stone well with a small historical marker beside it. There is a manhole cover on top of it and a ladder inside of it. 16 feet below the surface is a rock, Braddock's Rock. It marks the place where General Braddock first landed and it's the oldest landmark in the nation's capital. Now, before you fall asleep, <laughs> this is the nugget. Okay, this is the nugget. According to legend, some of that rock was used as, the, as foundation stone for the White House and Capitol. But the true significance... The true significance of that stone is that it served as the starting point for the earliest surveys of Washington, D.C. On old maps, it's inscribed as the key of keys, not the king of kings, the key of keys, two different ideas. That was the name given to Braddock's Rock because it established the coordinate system for the entire city. Every principal meridian and baseline was measured from that Initial point. The key of keys, the starting point for the coordinate system for the whole city. See, this, this rock, Braddock's Rock, was a frame of reference, a tethering point for the whole planning and whole building of Washington, D.C. And now as we see Washington, we, we see, we know that it's incredibly planned and so meticulous that it started from this key of keys, this tethering point. And the reality is that we have keys of keys. We have these frames of reference with a lot of the ideas and a lot of the activities that we participate in in this life, whether we explicitly think about them or not. You know, sports have rule books. Roads have traffic laws. Uh, businesses have employee handbooks. Legal agreements have contracts, and the U.S. and many other nations have constitutions. These frames of reference allow us to look and decide within these systems, these organizations, and these thought processes what is legitimate or illegitimate, what is helpful or detrimental, what is consistent or inconsistent, what is true or false. 
And while I could use a lot of different examples this morning, because I am a pretty big fan of Major League Baseball, that's what comes naturally to me. So please bear with me if you're not a baseball fan. But I think it'll be easy enough to follow. So, Craig, I'll use you as an example, but we won't get to you until, let's just say first you come to me with this, this claim, right? Seth, <clears throat> there are three outs in a half inning in Major League Baseball. Now, I could go, and I, it'd be really easy, very simple for me to confirm or deny that. I just go to the Major League Baseball rule book. I look through, and I go, yes, yes, absolutely, you're right. There are three outs in a half inning of baseball. Because there is a mutual understanding and agreement that we accept the, the context of this rule book of Major League Baseball to be true. We have that common understanding as well, I don't really even know if you're a baseball fan, but as, as, as understanders of Major League Baseball, we, we, we have that common acceptance of that. But if, you were to come, if Craig were to come to me, which he'd be more likely to come to me with something like this, and come with this claim and say, Seth, <clears throat> the Seattle Mariners are the best team historically in Major League history. Now... That might be a little bit harder <clears throat> to confirm or deny, but if I spent a little bit of time researching, comparing the, the, the rule book of Major League Baseball and the statistics which have recounted how Major League Baseball has gone, I could probably define best as some combination of most wins during the regular season most wins and appearances in the playoffs and most wins and appearances in the World Series. For those of you who don't know, the World Series is the championship of Major League Baseball. Now, after a little bit of research and defining what best is, I could look at the rules and statistics and come to the conclusion that in fact, the Seattle Mariners are not the best team historically in the major leagues. Fair enough? Based on the assumption that Craig and I agree that the rules and the statistics of Major League Baseball are true and accurate. And I apologize, Mariners fans, but no matter how much you love your Mariners, and no matter how good 2001 was, okay, no one's taking that from you, but they simply have not proven themselves to be the best over time. Now, knowing Craig and the debater that he is, he may come back to me and say, in fact, I, no, you actually wouldn't do this because you actually also have a high value for constructs and yeah. So, but he could come back to me and say, I, in fact, reject the, context, the contents of the rule book and the statistics of Major League Baseball, and I stand upon my claim that the Seattle Mariners are the best team in Major League history because they make me feel good. <laughs> and because I love Navy and Teal. <laughs> and because my uncle used to play for them, and I was born in Seattle. I know you weren't born in Seattle, but were you born in Marysville, which is kind of close? Whatever. <laughs> or because I'm a little bit of a contrarian and I like to root for teams that are historically not the most successful because I want people to think I'm unique. <laughs> I'm not pointing any fingers in the room. <clears throat> now, at this point, the conversation would become a little bit hard to follow, don't you think? Because Craig, or whoever makes that argument, has now lost a little bit of credibility when he makes the claim about who the best team in Major League history is if he doesn't even accept the fundamental frame of reference that defines the game. Now, obviously, when we're talking about baseball, it's pretty simple. It's, it's kind of a ridiculous conversation. There's not really a debate here. It was very easily shown. Mariners aren't the best team. You still root for them. Home team, go, go, go. But they're not the best team. It's a silly conversation, but it's the conversation that we're having in culture about the Bible. 
It's a conversation that we're having in truth. And I'm not just talking about atheists and agnostics and people from, from, from other world religions. I'm talking about in the context of people who claim the name of Jesus. You see, many of us bear the affiliation of Jesus, but we deny his word. There is a, there, there is a deception that's very present that, that, we can, that we can follow Jesus and reject the scriptures. The problem with that approach is that Jesus not only affirmed the scriptures, but he upheld the scriptures, he proclaimed the scriptures, and he fulfilled the scripture. And so, as we go about this, what we're doing is actually accepting parts of who Jesus is. Parts of who Jesus is. The parts that resonate most with our current lifestyle, the parts that resonate most with our current decision-making, the parts that resonate with how we feel. You see, but when we do that, we approach Jesus like a buffet line. We go to him, go into that favorite section, dessert, or I'm not a big dessert guy, I'm all about like, I don't, I don't know, chicken, whatever. <laughs> <clears throat> So I go, to the, I go to the buffet line, <laughs> and we go, and we go, oh, you'll always be with me. I like that. Oh, you love me enough to die for me. Yes, please. Turn the other cheek. How noble. Love your neighbor. That, that's what I've been trying to tell everyone. <laughs> love your neighbor. Add that. But then there's that other section of the buffet that's a little like, you make you feel like, I don't know how I feel about that. And it may be really great food, but you're like, ah, buffet, huh? You go over, you already got some, you got your favorites on your plate, right? And you see, separate the sheep from the goats. Oh, that's a little exclusive. Oh, giving into lust is like committing adultery. That's a little heavy, wouldn't you say? Cast into the outer darkness, oh, that's horrible. Or even, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And you're there at the buffet line. You go, Jesus would never say that. And then when we come to the end of the buffet line, what we have is our very own personal Jesus. Custom formed and fitted by me for me. The issue is when we try, and, and trust me, there are people who are trying to do this. When we try to walk in relationship with the God of the universe under the name of Jesus, but we are deciding who Jesus is, we are instead actually walking in a very sad egocentric relationship with a falsely idealized version of ourselves. Custom fit Jesus isn't Jesus at all. He's you. And so we come and we, and we worship and we say, Jesus is so good. He's so gracious. He's so tolerant. He's so worthy of my praise, but we don't accept all that scripture says about who he is. You are, I am worshiping me. I am on the throne. When do I do that? I put myself on the throne when I decide who Jesus is. So I want to go back now to the original passage that we were reading in 2 Timothy and hear just how timely and prophetic Paul's words were to Timothy, but this time, I want us to read it as a letter to Heart of the City Church, as a, as a letter to the church of the Western world, to us. Starting in verse 14 and 15, <clears throat> again, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it 
and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. This is also translated as the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Heart of the city, don't get caught up in all this garbage that people are spreading. Remember where you came from. Remember those things you know to be true. And and don't forget that the scriptures have the power to open your mind to bring this revelation, to bring this wisdom that leads to this revelation of who Jesus is and salvation through him. Don't forget, heart of the city. And then 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Heart of the city, the scriptures are trustworthy and useful. And they're breathed out by God himself. And they're pivotal for the discipleship process and for seeing people mature in Christ. Heart of the city, you got to get this. He continues in chapter 4, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Look, part of the city, I'm not messing around. These aren't just tips. You have to be ready to preach. You have to be ready to encourage. You have to be ready to bring correction where correction is needed. And of course, always walk in patience. Be patient with people. Be long-suffering, but be bold. Be bold, heart of the city, because there's going to be times when you have to say tough things and show people in the way they should go, even when it's difficult. In verse 3 and 4, this is, this is, the, this is the place where I just, I, I go, Paul, how the heck did you know? How the, how the heck did you know that 2018 was coming? For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Heart of the city, you're going to notice people wandering from the truth. You're going to encounter people who the truth in, of the scripture is just too hard to accept. And people are going to form new and different beliefs that cater to and justify whatever path that they have chosen to walk. Be ready for that, heart of the city. Be watchful for that. And in verse 5, and In contrast, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Look, heart of the city, it is going to get rough. You're going to get ridiculed. You're going to get cornered. Someone's going to delete you on Facebook. (laughs) Someone's going to send you a scathing email. Someone's going to text you. Someone's going someone's gonna to not invite you to the next thing. It's going to be tough, but hold fast. Fight to the finish. Stay strong. Stay rooted in those truths that you know. And, he fin- and, and this section finishes with verse 6 and 7. For I am already poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. See, heart of the city... Paul speaking, my time is almost done. I did what I came to do. But now I'm entrusting this to you and the people that you are co-laboring with, that you are working with, to continue on this work that I and so many others have given our lives for. Can you hear this letter that Timothy is receiving? Now, at this point, you, may be, you, may, you might ask, and maybe not, but Seth, where's the balance? I, I thought the Holy Spirit was the one who leads us into all truth, the one who guides us. I thought he was the, the, the one that Jesus promised who would be with us, and, 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 and it, it would help us through all these situations. And my answer to you would be absolutely, 100% true. There's, I, I would never want to try to pull the Holy Spirit out of the equation because he is the catalyst of the equation. 
The Holy Spirit was in the birth of the scriptures. The Holy Spirit is there to help us interpret the scriptures, and he speaks to us and moves through us in ways that can and should be confirmed by the scriptures. See, the, the Holy Spirit illuminates and quickens. When I say quickens, he springs to life before our eyes, the scriptures, he makes, he, he makes it so as we're, reading, as we're reading the word, it's unlike any other reading experience, transformative in nature. Hebrews 4.12 says this, for the word of God is living and active. Think about it. Is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit. Listen, listen to this of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When we read this, we're not just reading from history. We're not just reading words that were written long ago. When we read this, it reads us. It speaks into our situations and into the wrestlings of our heart that we're afraid to share with anyone else. Those things that we've kept to ourselves, that we've been, re- we've been going, God, what? The word comes alive and speaks to those things. But it works both ways. It works both ways. You see, we're all in a process of learning to distinguish the voice of the Holy Spirit from the voice of the enemy and from the voice of our own thoughts and emotions and every other voice out there. And so that's why it's so important that we look to the logos, which don't, I don't want to lose you, the Greek term for God's written word, in order to help us identify the sound of his rhema, his spoken word. We look to the logos, his written word, in order to help us identify the sound of his rhema, his spoken word. Because the two... Contrary to what some people would tell you, the two are in agreement, both proceeding from the very same heart of God. Now, over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking to you, we're going to be discussing different ways what Batterson, this author in in this book, calls them languages that God uses to speak to us. So, Seth, why are you starting with scripture? When I thought of whisper, I was thinking of all the other ways that God spoke to us, like the ways that we hear in the prophetic words and in the prayer time and in the secret place and in all these different signs that he gives us. The reason why we start with scripture today is because scripture is the language of God with which we compare and test every other language. It is our key of keys our frame of reference for learning the voice of God. So what do we do with this? Well, this is not a message about convincing you to read your Bible more. So you're welcome for that. Although, I guess, if you're not reading the Bible at all, it is that. (laughs) Because in in order to even get to my primary intention for you today that we would walk away with, you do have to read it some. But the primary encouragement for today would, that be, we would, read, would be that we would read this book differently. We'd read it differently. That every time we open it or we, we go and we, and we find the app or whatever, that we actually take a moment to, to reflect and consider what we are about to partake in. That maybe instead of making sure you get through all the chapters of your reading plan that day, or making sure you rush through a few Proverbs on your way out, so you're not a lunatic for the rest of the day, you consider that the God of the universe has something to share with you every time you open this. Every time you open this. Now, I'm not talking about goosebumps, okay? I'm not, I'm not talking about like where we go and we spend time with God and we're like, well, I, I didn't get the feel, so 
I didn't get the feels, so I guess I, guess I really didn't get in the word. I guess, I, I guess that wasn't a successful uh, secret place, quiet time, because I didn't get the feels. I didn't, I, there was no tears, no goosebumps. No, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about a whisper. I'm talking about a whisper that is there to be heard if you're ready to listen. But if you don't hear it at first, please don't be discouraged. Please don't be discouraged because, look, this God that we serve, we so often are trying to put him in these, little, in these little constructs of our mind that we go, oh, God must be like this. God's goodness looks like this. God's kindness looks like this. This is the character of God. If God's character isn't like this, then I reject the character of God. He's beyond that. And he's beyond us trying to put him in our microwave culture. Where we go, we, get, we, we open the word, we say a little prayer, and we go, why didn't you speak to me? Are you even there? Are you even there, God? Do you even care? I was reading for 15 minutes. And you didn't, I didn't hear you say a thing. <laughs> what if we allowed a little bit of time to meditate, not meditate, but meditate, chew, wow. to chew on what we've read, to reflect on it, and even commit to memory. Oh, wow, that sounds, memorizing scripture, that sounds really religious. Yeah, if you do it for religious reasons, if you do it out of legalism, it is. But let's look to Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, okay, the psalmist, and it's all about how this psalmist is delighting in and trusting in the law of the Lord. Now, let's just take a pause real quick and think about that. This guy is freaking out about the Mosaic law. You guys aren't catching that, I don't think. He is delighting in and writing the longest chapter in Scripture about the Mosaic law. Do you guys know the Mosaic law? It's pretty tough, pretty hard to get super jacked about, okay? Okay. How much more should we in this new covenant, Matthew through Revelation, how much more should we delight? And it says in verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, this idea of hiding, this idea of hiding his word in our heart, it's so important because it allows us, it allows us to distinguish the voice of the Holy Spirit from all the other voices in real time. What I mean, what, when I say real time, what do I mean? So if we don't have the word of God in our hearts, we hear something, whether we hear directly, we hear a prophetic word or, or whatever, and when, then we have to go and be like, does that align with scripture? Does that align with scripture? Does that align with scripture? But when we have it hidden in our hearts, listen, when the thoughts and the ideas and the words come into our minds or are spoken over us by other people, the storehouse of scripture in us, in partnership with the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, allows us to discern the truth from the falsehood. Memorizing scripture isn't about a religious duty. It's about knowing his voice. And as we do this, we will learn to hone in on and dial in like Craig preached last week. I only hear one shepherd's voice. I can ignore all the other ones. They call their sheep, and it's like, a, I know that shepherd's voice. Hmm. Will you stand with me?